screws loose, they done stripped the bolts on them. Should've never sent them to pick up the work for them. Sprayed the park and had my shit inside the car. Marcus Smart Boy was shooting with a 36 on him. Said if he wasn't in the rush, they was all goners. Tank cursive on the jets, he was gonna show and John them. They were sleeping on the guard. Hello, Chuddy Heads, and welcome to another edition of Chuddy's Corner. I'm your host, Ben Handler, joined, as always, by my co-host, Nick Perino. Nick, how we doing? Good. Feeling energized. Okay. We love energy around here. We love energy. So uh, we came into today ready to record, expecting to uh, kind of recap the uh, 4-1 series loss for the Celtics to the Brooklyn Nets to kind of talk about... Uh, what happened over the course of the series, over the course of the season, uh, maybe eulogize the season a bit, move on to the off season with some speculation, nothing too exciting. And then this morning, a few hours ago, the bombshells came down that uh, Danny Ainge is thinking about stepping down. And from there, it was just a whirlwind of one story after the other. So we will get into all of that in just a minute. First, a little bit of housekeeping. You can subscribe to Chuddy's Corner anywhere that you get your podcasts. We're on Apple Pods. We're on Spotify. We're on Stitcher. We're on Google Pods. You can watch the video of the podcast anytime you want on Vimeo or at our hub site, nickperino.com. Also, your home for any real estate needs. And you can follow either one of us on Twitter if you'd like to get involved in the conversation. Nick is at Nick Perino, and I am at king chuddy please engage us subscribe write a review tell us what you think tell us we suck whatever you want we'd love to hear it and we will probably respond on the podcast all right so moving on into the good stuff let's uh quickly start by wrapping up the season and then we'll get into all the uh the juicy stuff that's going on in the front office what's happened why it happened what it means etc but again first last time we joined you was just over a week ago, as it is now Wednesday, June 2nd. We're recording right around 4 p.m. The Celtics season ended last night in Brooklyn. They uh, they went out with a fight, but they were, were just overmatched by this Nets team. Pretty much everything we saw and said last week, as we had recapped the first two games, remained to be true. The Celtics had more fight at home, looked better. They obviously won game three, which, uh, I mean, to me, Winning one game is almost a win, but that was it. They didn't really have much of a puncher's chance. Um, came out in game four, came out strong. The first quarter was good. The first half was solid. Uh, the more the bench played, the worse it got. The Nets had basically historically great shooting. Um, and, you know, they've got three superstars. We got one, basically, at least for this series. That's what it was. Uh, you know, upsets like that don't really happen in the NBA. So largely this played out the way we thought. Uh, if you joined us last week, you heard me mentioning that the Chuddy team, Nick and I, would be in attendance for game four in a packed TD garden that was absolutely raucous, great environment. Sadly, it wasn't enough to bring the Celtics a win, which would have almost miraculously evened the series 2-2. Um, but, yeah, but it was still fun. It was a great time. And so, Nick, I will start with asking – Please, I think a lot of people are dying to know. So tell us, why did you throw the bottle at Kyrie? Uh, it was because he stomped the logo, really. Well, okay, so that was a hundred. That was it. It just yes. the logo stomp, and then that you just saw red. He was, he was chirping, you know, the, chirping the crowd the whole game, so I was already on edge. Um, <laughs> then you know, walked to the center, stomped lucky, right? And I had a good, I had a good look. So I mean, I couldn't pass totally. it up. It's probably a once in a lifetime opportunity to hit Kyrie well, with with an object so shoot or shoot exactly. and yeah it was once in a lifetime because you're so you're now banned from the garden and all sporting events there anything is that, is that uh, correct? pending pending litigation naturally awesome yes. awesome good stuff I'm fight, all right. I'm fighting it fighting it to the death you gotta you gotta great attitude <laughs> so um but in all seriousness there's not a ton to dissect basketball wise from that series that i guess you either don't already know or we haven't already hit upon so real quick, just because I, I almost don't want to have this conversation, but we ha kind of have to. So any thoughts in seriousness about the Kyrie logo stomp? Do you like not care at all? Are you like horribly offended? Do you fall somewhere in between? And do you make anything of the Celtics reaction 
lack of a reaction. I guess take a minute and just distress the whole situation in terms of Kyrie. If or if you even want to discuss it, I think it's worth discussing, which frankly I'm not sure it is. Uh, I mean, I don't think we spent too much time on it, but yeah, I mean, it doesn't uh, in a vacuum. It's like not a big deal because you know Kyrie's a you know Kyrie, so you can only take what he does and says um, you know so much. But the fact that what really bothers me is that we like we just don't have anybody to stand up to him that's willing to stand up to him. Like the guys that we have on the team that are, you know, quote unquote, tough guys, which I guess would be Marcus and Tristan. They're like buddies with Kyrie. The whole team seems to be buddies with Kyrie, which I don't, I don't know if that's just the whole league is like that. And, you know, he's just well respected and liked around the league and basically everyone outside the league that can't stand him, but it's just frustrating. I mean, he comes in, he chirps the crowd, obviously, you know, played a great game on Sunday. Um, you just think it, it'd be nice if just somebody stood up to him. I know it happened after the game. So like, I don't know what, I don't expect anyone to go like get in his face and, you know, yeah. throw a punch, but you know, next game, like he doesn't even get knocked down. Like, I guess that's really our more speaks to our, our team, you know, makeup as a whole really because we've never that's just not like who we are so I think that's it's more just emphasizing you know a part of the team you know something that we're missing which is you know a little bit of toughness a little bit of pride and I mean I think you know the way KG reacted to it I think you know made sense it's like you know you don't go into someone else's arena and stomp on the logo and you know get zero pushback it's just not that's not how it should be. Um, and I don't know if it's just, you know, the league as a whole now is just kind of soft, but you got to think on, you know, a lot of teams in the league or some of the good ones anyways, that you'd get some sort of resistance, but I don't know. Yeah. I don't know. I, I, I struggle with that one. Cause I mean, on the one hand I hear like KG and these guys like freaking out about it. And it's like, all right, come on. He like <laughs> rubbed his shoe on a big picture of a leprechaun. Like, let's not do this um then i mean i think like the reality is the fans and everyone else probably hates this guy you're right like the the guys in the league do like him they're friends with him they played with him there as far as i can tell there's one guy who doesn't like him and that's Jalen brown and i i mean he basically has (laughs) that's no surprise everyone knows that they didn't get along he was the one guy who was you know going all the way back to when Kyrie was here and called first called out the young guys because of the end of that game saying like they don't know how to win or whatever and it was Jalen who pushed back and so clearly those guys butted heads and here it was Jalen kind of coming out with that four minute monologue he delivered about uh you know putting everything in perspective and he kind of pointed his com- comments without saying Kyrie's name at saying how he didn't like how someone was kind of bringing this up um in the context that he was and using it for his own agenda or using it to distract from a playoff game or whatever he said. I mean, so I think if there's one guy who maybe doesn't like Kyrie and would have gone out there and challenged him, it was Jalen who obviously wasn't there. Uh, but yeah, I mean, I think like the reality is Tatum, Marcus, those guys are his friends. They played with him for years. They were friends with him before that they've got like connections that go back. Kyrie and Tatum are obviously Duke guys. So you know, this isn't the eighties and nineties where these teams like really hated each other. They're mostly all friends from AAU and whatever. So I think it kind of goes both ways. Like I'm with you to an extent, it would have been nice, but at the same time, these guys are his friends. They know that they're overmatched out there, you know? So maybe if it was like a more intensely competitive series and got to game seven and he's doing that kind of stuff, we would have seen that. But I think in the capacity that we're in, it's like, these guys are his friend. They're not going to take a cheap shot at him or try to end his career, like risk injury when they're probably not even going to win the game. I don't think clearly they weren't like as offended as some of these guys from back in the day or whatever. So I don't know. I think the whole thing is kind of like much ado about nothing. I'm, I'm pretty ready to just move on from like the whole Kyrie story in general. At this point, I think it is what it is. Everyone knows all the history. Um, and yeah, I, I'd almost, I don't, I'm not really even sure there's like much more to address unless you got anything else. No. And like, it's not really like the, like what he did it's just what well, his right intent, what his intent was just kind right of pisses me off. Like, yeah there's, and there's no the way there's right he for- tries to play the victim but at the same time he's obviously like pouring gasoline on the fire you know yeah. if he really didn't <laughs> didn't want all this stuff like and, you know and i get it it's fair play like the crowd is 
going at him all night as he like deserved. And he was, you know, he was like egging him on, like raising his fist, whatever, like bring it. So, I mean, it was all good and fun until the water bottle thing. And then it just escalated into a whole other conversation. The logo thing in itself, I think is almost like laughable that, like you said, he waited till the game was over. Everyone was gone and goes and does that against the Celtics. Like, let's see what happens when they have to face some real adversity. So I don't know, whatever. That's all I got on the nets other than, you know, they're really damn good. And it's frustrating as a Celtics fan. I obviously don't like (laughs) want him than them to do well, but uh, it's, there's not much you can do, especially when they play like that. So uh, tough situation there, but I think that's enough on, on Kyrie. Everyone's going to have their own opinions and uh, a lot of them are quite loud, but. In terms of the basketball, any anything else to, to say from the Nets series? Uh, I'll just start and say that well, it almost didn't even feel like the playoffs watching, like especially last night. Um, I mean, I think games three and four certainly did. Um, the season as a whole and the result are disappointing. But, I mean, if you just look at the series in a nutshell with all of the context – it's hard to really be say you're like disappointed. I think if anything, the Celtics represented themselves pretty well on the court. I thought most guys individually played like largely to their expectations and what I would want from them. The guys who were on the court, um, nobody gave up. They showed fight and they showed pride. And it seems almost like unfair to, to criticize anyone who was on the court. Um, Cause the nets are just freaking awesome. And like, you look at the percentages of their shooting and everything and the stats and they don't even seem real and watching the game. It, it almost feels more like that. Like I look back and I'm like, wait, KD like missed shots. I don't remember that. So, um, I mean, you just almost just have to appreciate the nets and think like, honestly, it's a probably impressive that we even won a game. Yeah. Last time, I mean, last podcast, I think everything that we said pretty much, stood true to the most part obviously we didn't expect them to win but i don't think anyone really did i, I think our and i, I think I we even think, said for them to win tatum would like need to score 50 and right that's yeah. what happened <laughs> so i mean i think we were we were you know pretty spot on the last you know the last episode so um there's not like you said there's not much more to add than what we already talked about um like it's awesome that we won that was a fun game um and I think, you know, all, all we really were looking for was them just to play hard and maybe keep it close and just go out with some pride. Um, you know, winning one game, I think, pretty much does that. Um, obviously, the next the next uh, couple of games didn't go as, as well. But um, so, yeah, I mean, it's there. We're just severely overpowered, uh, which I think most of the league will be with against the Nets. Um they're not only super talented, they're super efficient. You know, it's just, it's a, that three headed monster. I mean, Kyrie was, was a uh, 50, 40, 90 guy. I think Durant was close to that, wasn't he? It was. Yeah. Um, and Harden, you know, he's always been fairly efficient, even though his, his game, that step back three is, you know, somehow super efficient. Yeah. There's um, nothing you can do about that. No. And then when he gets to the, when he gets inside, you know, near the rim, he finishes. So, I mean, it's just three guys yeah. that can get any shot they want and hit it at a high rate. So, you know, if they're, if one or two of them are on, that's enough to win it, win the game. Um, yeah. I, KD is just unstoppable. Like you said, mm-hmm. I, I, I don't remember. I remember like a handful of misses. And it's just, it was so weird. Like when I see him get the ball, I'm like, all right, he's going to do this and then get to the rim and or hit a 15 footer or whatever, and then go down to the court and then hopefully we can keep up. And if you missed a shot, it was like, you know, it was as if it didn't even happen. Um, so there's not, I don't really have anything else to add really. It's just, it kind of yeah. played out how we thought. And um, we have a lot of work to do and, you know, they should, they should either be in, in the finals or right there up to the end. So, um, the Nets, you're saying the Nets. Oh yeah. Yeah. No, I mean, I'm, I'm pumped for that, uh, Nets Bucks series. I think that'll be awesome. That's basically the, it's basically the East finals, if not the actual finals, potentially those could be the two best teams given, uh, the state of the league and health and this and that, but 
anyway, yeah, I, I mean, I think we agree on that. We're not splitting the atom here. It's nothing that anyone doesn't already know. And I mean, I think the it was already pretty much the death sentence when Jalen was ruled out for the playoffs, but then losing Rob and Kemba, it felt like almost unfair at that point. I mean, there was really nothing we could do. And it was, uh, you could see it. I mean, like I said, in, in the last couple of games, it was like we came out and fought and you kind of had belief for a second, but it's at a certain point you go into that bench and <laughs> some of the guys, you know, they're back to having to play semi heavy minutes where Grant's playing semi minutes. Jabari Parker for crying out loud is playing heavy minutes, Romeo Neesmith, all these guys who I, I like, and it's not a knock on them. And like I said, a lot of them actually, showed me something and I thought played well, but <laughs> you're going against three hall of famers. And a lot of these guys are just getting their feet wet or fighting to, to stay in the league. Like what can you expect? So again, a lot of issues with the Celtics all season, but I don't think there's anything you can really criticize for these guys in terms of end that playoff series. Like I said, I think they just, you drop, you let, you lose hold of the rope for, for even like two minutes and the nets are, they go on these crazy runs and there's it's like an avalanche there's just not much you can do once it gets started so that was that um I got a few notes just to rip through all kind of like quick hitters on the Celts that I think were worth discussing uh first of all I mean the number one thing that has me feeling good is just like <laughs> Jason Tatum in the playoffs damn like he keeps improving obviously every year but the improvements in the playoffs that he makes from the regular season is just like on another level and then I mean after he didn't start out so great, obviously he got poked in the eye, missed half a game. But what he did after that, going 50, then 40, and then what, 32 in the last game. Um, and he just looked looked the part. Like he knew what he wanted to do. He was being super aggressive. He was getting to his spots. He's getting to the free throw line. It didn't matter who was covering him. He, you know, he was going against KD. He's guarding KD on defense, doing a great job. Like he you just watching the series. Like there were times where in a series with all those guys, it looked like he was still the best player on the court. So again, nothing revelatory here, but just further, further kind of proof and confirmation that like Jason Tatum is that dude. And yeah, he's not carrying a team to the title right now by himself, but again, for a 23 year old kid, like it is hard to understate just the levels of what he's doing and continues to do in the playoffs. And as much as uh, sometimes it feels like the sky is falling, we've got Jason Tatum and a lot of teams in the league would trade places just based off that fact alone. He, it's, you know, I hate when people overreact when, you know, regular season Tatum has an off game or we go on this, you know, a losing streak and everyone's like, well, is he really the guy? Is this a guy that can carry you to a, you know, title as a number one? And I mean, obviously we don't know that, but I think, signs are still pointing you know in that direction mm -hmm. I mean I'd say right now if you had to guess one way or the other then he's you know he's should be that guy at some point in his career um, yeah I mean even sooner it's than not, later like he's not that far away from it right now that's the no. whole point and I mean and he I didn't mean, have his running not, mate he's getting double and triple teamed the, the Nets are scheming for him every play every possession nothing's coming easy yeah and if you ask you know, a lot of people around here, especially is like, oh, you're just like a, you know, you're a fan and you're not really thinking clearly. It's like, you know, maybe you're overrating him. Like a lot of Celtics fans tend to overrate players sometimes, but you know, you, you go around national, nationally, national media players, coaches. I mean, they all think that he's that guy and mm -hmm. he has, you know, MVP contention potential. Um, I, mean, I don't yeah. know if he'll ever be an MVP, but he'll, if you're in the discussion, then you're, you know, yeah. you're, <laughs> that's all you really need. Like you, you don't right. need to be the MVP of the league to win a mm -hmm. championship, but if you yeah. know, people are throwing votes your way, then you know, right. you're good enough. So no, I think you go around, you compare his resume, both statistically and in like terms of winning and accomplishments and his role, he's on par with anyone else in the league at this point. Like, literally i mean you're talking about the all-time greats who have ever played the game at his age and experience most of them had not accomplished what he has accomplished um it's incredible and you know you point anyone else around the league you choose any other guy like they haven't done that you know everyone's already anointed luka Doncic, the next king of the nba and for good reason and i'm not saying he doesn't deserve that that's maybe the one young guy you would put ahead of tatum but like Luka Doncic has not won a playoff series and uh the way the last two games have looked i'm not sure that's going to change this year so in three years in the league, Tatum had gone to a two conference finals, and on one of those teams was like the clear leader and best player. 
Luka Doncic, for all the amazing things he's done, still has not gotten out of the first round. So people tend to live in a vacuum around here and uh, only focus on what's in front of them without kind of looking at the big picture. And the big picture is that we have one of, if not like the best up and coming stars in this league. And you got to feel really, really good about that as a Celtics fan. Yeah, and I've, I've been thinking the same thing too, kind of in the, the whole Luca combo. And um, I mean, I, I probably would say that even at this point, Luca's probably, he probably, he looks like he might be the better player long term, but it's obviously, it's too early to tell. I mean, he's been in the league, you know, this is what, his third year now? Mm-hmm. Um, and he's awesome. I mean, he's basically like, right. you know, he looks like a 30, 10, 10 guys, like averaging, basically averages a triple double. He's yeah. awesome. Um, but, you know, like you said, for people to be like, you know, Tatum's not that guy, and then say in another breath that Luca, you know, he's not Luca, or like, you know, Luca's the next guy. It's like, well, how do you know? Like, like you said, mm-hmm. he, hasn't, he hasn't won a playoff right. series either. And I'm not saying that means if he's I'm that sure guy he will. Not. Right. Yeah. This isn't, this just, isn't Luca slander. I, we both, I think really love, love Luca. And yeah. I, I think the point is more just like people in Boston, especially seemingly in the media or fans who consume too much of the local media, especially they move the goalposts and they don't look around the league. They see, you know, see, see here a highlight or a stat on sports center. They're like, Oh, well, why can't we have this guy or that guy or this guy? Yeah. And it's like, appreciate what you have. Yeah. It's, <laughs> it's just a, it's just a comparison as far as how people are grading them. Cause sure. Um, like I said, he's probably the better player um, mm-hmm. right now. And, you know, I wouldn't say it's like by a mile, but um, you know, you, you can't say he's the next big thing and he's going to, you know, lead his team to, to, you know, multiple championships and then say Tatum's not that guy. Cause I mean, you, you look at their body of work so far, Tatum, you know, has outplayed him by a significant margin. Mm-hmm. So you, you can't, you can't have it both ways it's either, you know, it's either it's too soon to judge, to judge Luca or it's too soon to judge and it's too soon to judge Tatum. So it's just, right. it's the consistency is not there, but right. one, one thing that, um, you know, about this playoff series, that uh, obviously, um, was that Tatum, you know, obviously was, you know, looked like he could be a guy that, you know, carries a team, but it was also a little bit frustrating because, you know, we, Basically, I, I know we were kind of – we didn't really have another option, but he had to be the guy. He had to touch the ball every possession, every time we went up the court. And if we wanted to win any games, he had to score 50, which was what he did. So it's kind of like – I feel like we should have been – that should have been more of the game plan during the regular season. I don't want him to play, you know, 45 minutes. But, you know, if he's playing 35 minutes a game or whatever – he should touch the ball every single possession and the offense should run through him. And I know for stretches it does, but you saw in the playoffs, if you, if, if you put the ball in his hands, he's going to make the right play. He's either going to score, he's going to find somebody, someone's mm-hmm. going to double team him. So I think okay, that- but I, I, I don't know. I think it's unfair to say that again, when he didn't have Jalen Brown, another 25 point game scorer, like that changes the math a lot. That makes it so that, he he really I mean especially once Kemba went out too not that Kemba was helping a ton and we'll get to Kemba in a minute but it was like we had to had to go to Tatum we didn't have other creators I mean you know Smart and Fournier did their best but those those are your number two and three guys it's not gonna happen (laughs) and it didn't so if Jalen's out there you know we don't it doesn't need to run that much through Tatum I get what you're saying to to a certain extent but I don't know. I don't think you need to overburden him in the season. And again, Brown was there with him for most of the season and we lost him right before the playoffs. And then 48 still new to the mix and Brooklyn was, you know, they were, they were doubling Tatum a lot or trying to take him away. They weren't helping out much off 48 to get him any open shots to get it going. So again, that leaves smart. who's a solid playmaker. He's obviously got his shortcomings on offense, but he's, he's solid, but you, you don't want that to be like, your guy creating all your offense at a playoff, but we just didn't have another choice. And I mean, again, you get the like, why is smart shooting so much, blah, blah, blah. And it's like, uh, who, who do you want to start forcing shots? Like, look who's on the floor. If they take away Tatum, who the hell else is supposed to shoot it? Marcus smart open. Look is the best offense we have any chance of getting right now because of who's out there. Like, what do you want? So 
I don't know. I get what you're saying, but I don't know. I think Tatum is fine doing that and just doing it in stretches in the regular season is enough. And he wouldn't have had to carry such a massive burden, at least if even if Jalen was there. So I certainly hope that we'll never see him this overmatched in uh, in a playoff series again. But um, I don't know. I don't think you can just go fully like leaning into that because no. of that reason. I think you got to, you know, build on what you had with Jalen and again, hope that we have more depth in the future and we're actually somewhat healthy. Yeah, I don't want I don't want Jalen to lose touches by any means. It's more just, you know, I want the ball, I want to go up the court and I want the ball more often than not to start in Tatum's hand. And that's where the offense starts to run, basically. Because I think he's capable of, you know, initiating an offense. Um, I just like, you know, he gets the ball, start running the offense, he gets to make the decision. Mm -hmm. I think more often than not, he makes the right call. Um they find the mismatch and, you know, the bright play might be for him to hand it off, give it to um, Jalen or whoever. So I don't want him to like, I don't want to go up the court, have him go into ISO and then just like kind of, you know, back down a smaller guard and then, you know, hit Jalen for, for a three or something. I just, I just want, I like him sort of running like a point forward role almost. Um, yeah. I think he's kind no. of earned that. I'm largely with you, and he has. He, you're absolutely right. He has pretty much earned that. So I'm fair with that. Um, we'll see how much that changes, I guess, going forward, as a lot a lot of things are changing. Um, other guys, I mean, I think, like I said, I think, you know, Marcus was Marcus. He didn't have his best season, but he looked like the usual Marcus in the playoffs. Again, he just – he had to be our second best player, and he, he did his best, but that's just not good enough against this team. We needed <laughs> – the thought problem was like, we needed Marcus to shut down Harden. Oh, but we also need Marcus to guard Kyrie. Oh, but we also need Marcus to, to help on everyone else. And it's like, you know, again, he did all he was, he, he could Thompson, uh, Tristan Thompson looked all right. He backed it up, uh, you know, kind of his talk and looked like playoff Tristan Thompson in a matchup that I didn't, wasn't sure he could help much. He did his best. Um, I thought Romeo Langford really, lo really looked good. And I was, I, um, it was promising for his future going forward. I think he, he had a lot of meaningful reps and he played pretty well, uh, mostly on defense and guarding, you know, some of the game's best. And he, he held his own for the most part. Um, they were completely ignoring him on defense. So uh, it was nice that in the last game, he's finally got aggressive, scored 17 points, his career high. That's something. Grant Williams had some nice minutes at the five, which is something I've said a lot. He seems to be a solid when he plays five, almost unplayable at the four. Unfortunately, he got in that position because Rob was injured. Saw me if you've heard that one. Uh, Kemba, we kind of talked about how disappointing it was last week on the pod and just even more disappointing the way it ended sitting out the last two games. I don't want to question his will, but, man, that is a, a tough look when, when your team really needs you to not even, not even be able to give it a go and dress for those games. It's tough. Uh, Jabari Parker, hey, he had some moments. Uh, is that a guy involved in the future? I have no idea. Can they teach him to play defense this offseason? I have no idea. Uh, Neesmith and Pritchard, they seemed like at least up to the moment and like they belonged, like there wasn't the stage wasn't too big for them. So that was something. Um, I don't know. But like that all is kind of whatever. <laughs> I don't know. Do you have any anything to say about any of those guys specifically? Anything that stood out? Any surprises other than kind of what I just summed up? No, it's pretty much it. I mean, uh Marcus, I thought Marcus had a very good series. Um, there was very little heat check Marcus, which I know frustrate a lot of people. Um, mm -hmm. But, you know, he needed a score. I mean, we needed somebody to score, and um, he did a pretty good job with that. He was, uh, I don't know what his numbers were, but I felt like he took good shots. Um, you know, a lot of his mid-range, going to the bucket, it's where I like mm -hmm. him. Um yeah, he didn't have a great game five, but before that, he was uh, had the I believe the best three point percentage of anyone in the playoffs. So I mean, o overall, yeah, like you said, he did a great series on both ends. He did everything you could expect from him, certainly. And the thing with two is, you know, when you say, "Oh, we need Marcus to, you know, slow down Harden, or we need him to slow down Kyrie and all that stuff," it's like it's too hard to put that assignment on anyone these days, just because how everybody switches everything on defense now. So right. it's like impossible to get the defensive matchup you want because they'll just switch it. Yeah. Um, so it's almost like all you can really hope for is, you know, good team defense. And 
you know, whoever gets switched on has to be, you know, a decent defender. You, you need to have five solid defenders or at least four. And then the right, and those four have to be able to, you know, make up for, you know, that one by, you know, help or whatever. Cause I mean, you know, the whole problem has been Kemba hasn't been, is obviously, you know, can't really guard anybody. Um, and we've tried to make up for it by team defense, but he's just so, he's just too small where, you know, there's only right. so much you can do. If you get him in the, you know, the low post, if someone comes over to help, it's just, you know, it's just too easy to, to move that ball to the open mm-hmm. guy. It's just, he's... and you can't get car rotating against this team against yeah. the Nats. Right. So, um, you know, that being said, Mark is still a good defensive game. I mean, series overall, I'd say. Um, he did, you know, did what he could. Uh, other than that, it was nice seeing Romeo get back in the mix. It's really, it's more encouraging that, you know, he basically got, you know, taken out of the rotation for a while when Neesmith was going mm-hmm. through that stretch. And to see him, you know, stay, you know, seemingly focused and, working hard and, you know, not letting it get to him mm-hmm. uh, and then come back, you know, towards the end of the season in the playoffs and get meaningful minutes and play well. Um, that's I think that says a lot about, you know, his character and his worth ethic. ethic. So, um, yeah, you know, I'm sure that earned him another year. I'm guessing at least, I don't know what his contract situation I mean, is. Romeo, that was only his second year in the league. Right. Not, so so let's like relax a little bit. He's not, I'm saying, you know, like if, Assuming like a trade, I don't think he's yeah, no, like a, a guy that gets, you know, moved for a roster spot. Oh, uh, no, definitely not. So it's, uh, I mean, basically, I just think it earns him the benefit of the doubt for another year anyways. Yeah. Um, you know, I know a lot of people already give up on him because of his injuries and whatnot, but um, mm-hmm. I think he's, I think I'm still ready to, you know, give him, give him another chance, see what he can do. Because uh, his defense is awesome. Right. And, if he can hit a corner three, it's all I really, it's all I really need for him. Play good defense yeah. and hit corner threes. Yeah, um, seriously. And he looked that, like he belonged, like defensively. Yeah. That was, the, yeah. you know, he was guarding Harden and Durant, and like I said, eight year, those guys are gonna score no matter who's guarding them. Yeah. But he thought he did a good job, and he was, yeah. you know, he did what he was, did what he was supposed to, and then some. So again, yeah. hopefully that gives him the confidence that he does belong out there. And hey, oh, I am, I am really good. Yeah, nice. If you can make, if you can make good players work harder to score points yeah basically as good of you know as good as defense gets in the nba right now right especially against the nets where these three guys where they'll score no matter what (laughs) if you can just frustrate them a little bit and you know maybe you know if they have to put a little more effort into it then you know use a little bit more energy then that's that's really all you can expect because i mean they're going to score. It's just, they are clearly. And I think that's one of those things too, where a lot, it's, it's so hard to judge defense and there's really, there are almost no stats that can capture it because it's, and this was series was kind of a perfect grasp of like how you have to watch defense. Cause you watch these players and you're like, you know, you could say, Oh, well, like they're scoring on Marcus, the left and right. They're scoring on this guy left and right. It's like, okay, that look who's these guys are. That doesn't mean it's bad defense. You can play great defense on them. And they're still going to score. So it, I think it was more, it was easier to tell when those guys were switching on to some of our lesser defenders, like Kemba in the early games, Tristan Thompson at times was getting switched out there, which I mean, he's obviously a center that's unfair to him, but it happens. Um, and then the last guy who I left for the last, of course, our, our newest buddy, Evan Fournier, who uh, I would say had an up and down series, uh, but like you saw him getting switched on to, especially Harden out there. <laughs> And at certain times it was, I was wondering if there was something personal between them. Cause like, man, Harden was just abusing him off the dribble. There was not much Fournier could do. He was committing fouls left and right. He was getting scored on left and right. It seemed like he was doing all he could to stay on his feet out there. Uh, he was like dancing. So you see something like that. And then I think it, it kind of makes you appreciate more just how hard it is and how good of a job guys like Marcus and Romy are doing, even just like to stay in front of them and force them to take a contested shot is so hard. So the fact like you, like kind of watching the contrast uh, makes you realize how good of a job those other guys are doing. But that was my way of kind of segueing into the guy who I don't know if it's fair or not, but will probably be most judged off this uh, series because we don't have much of a sample size. And that's Evan Fournier, who played in, I think, you know, 15 regular season games, some of them clearly bothered by COVID. 
once Jalen went out and then Kemba, we really, we needed him to step up and be our second guy on offense. He kind of was that, but he wasn't really consistent enough. There weren't any times where he really took over. Um, and then again, on defense, at times he was like holding his own and he was fighting out there, but at times it looks really bad. <laughs> um, and again, I don't know how much of that is just like, it's James Harden. It's Kyrie Irving. Like, what do you expect? Um, but I mean, again, he's obviously, he's now an expired contract. We just gave up picks and are, are part of the TPE to get him. So he's maybe like the biggest question mark. So did anything, I guess, that you saw in this series change the way you felt about Fournier? Are you taking much away from the series? If so, are you taking away positives, negatives? Do you, do you still want him back? I guess, did anything change about how you felt about Fournier based on this series? Um, so, I mean, before, before we traded for him, I was hearing a lot that his defense was, you know, his biggest weakness. Um, and then when he got here, it was like, Oh, it's not that bad. You know, it was regular season. Um, especially when we were healthy, he didn't have to guard, you know, anybody, you know, any of the top, like two options anyways, three options. Um, and then this, like you said, this postseason, he, definitely got exposed but those people that exposed him were you know a few of the best scorers you know ever so it's hard to really gauge judge it by you know him falling tripping over himself trying to guard Harden because a lot of people do <laughs> right. but exactly. it, the way it just looked it just didn't look good like he it looked like he had no idea he just couldn't hang with him um, mm-hmm. and I mean if you can just you just have to stay on Harden's like hip, basically. If you can't at least do that, then you know you have no shot. Um, so it was a little disappointing, um, but it's just it's too hard to judge. We didn't get a big big enough sample size. I think one thing I am concerned about, though, I'm not concerned about, but I think what we what we do know now is that he he can't be the third best scoring option on a team that's going to go deep. Um, he's like on the fringe of being that person, but I think on a team that's, you know, championship caliber, he's yeah. like maybe, you know, a scoring six man off the bench or something. Yeah. Um, and I mean, I think that's the role we envisioned for him when we traded for him and the, at full health, like still the, you know, like the idea when we got him was that like on offense, at least Kemba, Jalen, Jason are the three guys and that Fournier would come up off the bench and kind of solidify that crew. So like, I don't want to blame this on him or say it's like Fournier's fault that he it's, it's his fault. Why? Cause he was like one of the only guys who didn't get hurt and was thrust into a bigger role, like more close to what he was probably doing on the magic almost. So uh, it's really tough and unfair to judge him. But again, the judgment now will have to be made by the Celtics brass. And this is the sample size we got. Yeah. I don't, I don't think he, I don't think like we said, like you said, I don't think that's, what we envisioned him being is, you know, coming in and being like our second or third option. Mm-hmm. Um, but, you know, after seeing Kemba's, you know, health and the way he played the rest of the year in the playoffs, you know, you really got to think that, you know, Brad or whoever's going to be the GM is got, has to find a way to, you know, move on from him, you know, in some way where, cause he, Obviously, Kemba can't be our third scoring option because he's just not dependable enough, and he's, um, you know, he just looks like a shell of himself. So, yes. um, I know it's for another day, but the thing, the, the reason why I bring <laughs> that up is because, you know, we're gonna have a big decision to make with Fournier if we bring him back or not, and he's gonna get paid. I mean, yeah, he's gonna get a good contract. Um, yeah, the early reports today were that he's seeking right around 20, 20 million a year. And yeah. I mean, that's probably realistic for the yeah. market. So 20 times two or th- uh, three or four or something like that, I'm guessing. Yeah. Um, is probably what it's going to take. And I mean, that's what he's worth. But can we afford for Fournier to be making 20 million when we still have Kemba on the roster mm-hmm. with Tatum, with Jalen? Right. Um, I mean, we're going to be really up against the hard cap once we fill up the rest of the roster because obviously, you know, Marcus is under contract and um, 
We're just really in well, a tight it, spot. So it won't be the hard cap. The issue will be how much luxury tax the owners are willing to pay. Well, yeah. That, and how much are they willing to pay on a team that might not even be a contender? Like, if the Celtics had gone to the finals or something, I think the team would be willing to spend the money and say, all right, keep it together. But are they going to have one of the biggest luxury tax bills in league history on uh, an eight seed, like a seven seed, whatever? You know what I mean? So. I think maybe ownership will spend, but I'm not, I don't think they're going to spend for a team that might not even contend. So I think just looking at the math, like I don't see, I, I don't see how the Celtics start next season with Kemba Walker Evan Fournier and Marcus smart all on the team. Um, I just say that. Cause those are the only guys, you know, Marcus is at one more year at about 14 mil. Kemba, obviously that disaster of a high $30 million contract. And then Fournier, who we think is seeking around 20. So it almost seems like if they can't dump Kemba, then they got to get rid of probably either Fournier or Smart. Again, unless ownership is willing to pay the highest luxury tax bill that they ever have, one of the biggest in league history. I, I mean, I'd love that as a fan, but I'm not, I'm not sitting here and expecting it. I think they'll do everything they can to probably go the other way. Um, but I mean, again, so now we're kind of, we're kind of moving on. So we, should we just move on now to, to the big news? The real story is anything else on the, uh, the net series? I guess my closing thought would just be that it's really hard to, to pinpoint like anyone individually who underachieved or was disappointing. Um, you know, the whole, it was kind of the story of the season. We were just never whole. We never had a real ch- chance. It felt like, and that inevitably caught up with us. No, not really a surprise. We, we thought this was going to happen. So what happened? I thought we, we fought, we played fine. I'm not embarrassed. I was actually worried if anything, the series could have been a lot harder to watch and a lot more kind of embarrassing for the Celts. But I thought if anything, you know, they fought. And by the end of this, we might be looking back saying, Hey, they gave the Nets as good a fight as anyone. Yeah. Um, we just, everyone pretty much performed how we expected them to. It's just, or better or better. It's just not, not just, a great roster top to bottom. Right. Um, and the end, in- yeah, the injuries and, on top and of the that. injuries. Yeah. So, I mean, if, right. you know, if we were fully healthy, including Kemba, then everyone slotted into their appropriate role probably would have looked pretty good, but, mm-hmm. um, you know, that didn't happen. So mm-hmm. it's. It's hard to be, I mean, it's easy to be disappointed, but it's hard to really point the finger at any one player just because, you know, everyone exactly. played as you know, well as they could, basically. Right. And if you're going to um, turn around and be say something like, oh, like Ojale sucks, then it's like, well, you know what? If you're counting on Ojale for playoff minutes, it's more of a reflection of that the roster wasn't well put together or that Tony yeah. guys were hurt or like whatever. Again, you know, it's, it's not Sh- Shemi's fault that he sucks. He's... <laughs> <laughs> right. It's so. Yeah. Uh, it's just he's there and we need bodies. So, and I mean, I don't hate Shemi by any means. Um, no, it's just he is what he is. Mm-hmm. Um, so I don't want to single out Shemi, it's more just no, an, no, an example, just, but that, right, exactly. Um, so yeah, I don't know. I, I, it's easy to be disappointed by the season and the performance. And I'd say more than anything, um, if you want to be disappointed in the players, it's I'd say it was more the you know, the heart that they showed. I know you know, in this playoff series, maybe it was a little bit more um, than we saw in the regular season, but something, something was missing. Um, Mm -hmm. Some, it's like some bit of fight. It's just, it wasn't really there all year. Um, Maybe we saw it game, you know, four um, or game three. Um, Yeah. But you know, I thought they the, came out with that uh, fight. It was like, again, you just, it was to keep the fight analogy. It's you throw your best punches and then you get exhausted and the other guys just sitting yeah. there ready to start punching back. And <laughs> you can only yeah. take so many punches, yeah. I guess. So I don't know. It's, um, I mean, as much as I love Celtics and watching them play, even in a bad year, it's, I'm, I'm glad it's over. I'm ready to get to the off season <laughs> and I want to see, you know, I want to see, what we're going to do. I think, you know, big changes has already cut, uh, already started. So hoping mm-hmm. it keeps going in the, uh, into the off season. Fair enough. So without further ado, let's get into those big changes in that big off season. As like I said, I don't think anyone was really expecting on this, certainly not all of it, but to recap, we kind of woke up today. 
thinking towards the off season, we get hit pretty early. First, the report trickled out that Danny Ainge was thinking about stepping down. Uh, one thing led to another, and it's a whirlwind where then we have Danny Ainge is retiring. Not only that, his job as president of basketball operations is taken by Brad Stevens, who will now no longer be the head coach. Brad will be in fact leading the charge to fill that role. So the Celtics now have Brad Stevens as the president of basketball operations. Danny Ainge essentially out of the picture. No head coach as of this moment. Um, a lot of questions and a lot of uncertainty, certainly. A lot of speculation. What I told you that just now is, is basically all we know for sure at the moment. Um, the rest, again, you gotta either got to go by how much you trust what they're telling us or otherwise. So what they've told us, at least what they said, if you listen to the press conference, seen the reports, is that basically this is something that Danny has been thinking about for a while. Um, at least a few months, he's been seriously considering it. They've been talking about it. They tried to maybe talk him out of it. Uh, but it sounds like at the end of the day, best decision for him was to step away. It doesn't, it doesn't seem like an issue of him being forced out as it sounds like he's going to stay on at least through the summer, help Brad as much as he can. It sounds like they kind of talked about it and kind of tried to prepare Brad, see if it was something he was interested in. It sounds like from Brad's end, he absolutely is. He sounds like he's all in. I mean, again, obviously, what do you, what do you think they're going to say? You know, they're, they're saying the right things, but it sounds like this is kind of a plan that they like. They talked about keeping keeping the, the rest of the front office together. So the Mike Zarin, Austin Ainge's of the world, um, keeping some of that infrastructure to work together with Brad. Um, but yeah, a, a major bombshell. Again, I think on this pod, we had speculated about maybe that Ainge might be looking to step down or to get one of those kind of fake promotions where it sounds like a better position, but really they're giving the job to someone else. So that in itself didn't shock me. Ainge, I mean, Stevens now no longer being the coach and becoming the president of basketball operations, that was a legit shocker. Um, so I guess let's just start there. Like, what was your reaction to all of this? What was your first first thought when you saw these stories break across the screen? Was Were you like, okay, the Celtics are blowing it up? Were you like, what's happening? Where, where, where'd you fall? I had no idea what to think when I first saw it. Uh, it took me a little while to process it because – I just don't think, I don't know how, if anybody, how you could have seen this coming. Uh, right. We talked about, like you said, maybe Danny getting a fake promotion or stepping down. I mean, it's, it does sound like, I mean, he's had some, I guess, health concerns the last couple of years. And um, it almost feels like he's sort of the last year or two sort of lost the fire a little bit. Um, yeah. I mean, he's getting up there and he's been, you know, He's been oh. grinding for 20 years with this team. And it was, like you said, two years ago. That's when he had the heart attack, of course. Yeah. And uh, and it, it, it kind of has felt like he's been a little more removed um, since then, and understandably so. So, again, I think the age part of this is kind of like it It feels – it doesn't feel too bad to me. It feels like it was time um, probably for some change up the top. And, uh, you know, they all sound super confident in this change. Ainge, <laughs> you know, again, what's he going to say? But – he didn't sound in, in any of his press conferences or anything like someone who was being forced out and was kind of like resigning in name only to save face. It felt like truly it was his decision um, and something that he was all in on. Like, so when I first started to see the reports, I thought it was maybe them disguising language where they're, they were basically firing him and just letting him step down. But uh, I don't know, after at least taking a step back and looking, I think this, uh, this really was like his decision wholeheartedly. Um, which I didn't when it first broke. How do you, how do you see that? Do you, how much of this do you think actually is Danny's decision and intent versus the Celtics telling him, okay, this is what's happened. It definitely seems at peace with the decision. So I don't think it's like, you know, the, the ownership was like, Hey, uh, this isn't working. You got to go. I think I wouldn't be surprised if it was, you know, somewhat of a mutual decision where he started, sure. you know, maybe talking to them being like, you know what, uh, you know, I've been having thoughts about, maybe this being my last season or potentially winding down and they're like you know maybe it's a good idea let's start transition you out of here get a get a plan together because obviously you know the season doesn't end yesterday and then you have you sit down it's like all right how about brad you'd be president of basketball operations and danny you step down but obviously this has been in the works for you know more than a few weeks yeah probably sounds more like than since a few months 
since around the trade deadline is what they're saying. So, yeah. Um, so yeah, it sounds like they've had their eye on this kind of situation. So it makes you wonder even going back, like, well, how much was the Fournier trade really Brad's first move? Mm-hmm. Like, I don't know. It's again, we're still speculating. I'm sure we'll find out more, but uh, a lot of interesting things came to mind, but yeah, it sounds like this is something he's been at least considering for a few months um, and probably knew like it was just a matter of, of when. Um, and it seems like he's decided to do that now, right at the end of the season. Then, turn over a new leaf. He said that again, he was going to stay around. He was going to stay involved. He wanted to be near the team. It sounds like Austin, his son is staying on in some role uh, in the front office. So it doesn't sound like this is like a messy breakup or anything. It really does sound like you said, like everyone's at peace with this and that they genuinely think it's best for the team. And again, since specifically the heart attack, I don't want to blame that, but if you look at all the moves he's made, yeah, they really haven't been that great. So maybe it was time for a change. I don't, I think whenever we've doled out blame for this season and the kind of recent disappointments, Danny has probably been at the forefront of that. So usually it's kind of the coach or GM who gets changed before the players. So um, I don't hate that move in itself. And if it was a mutual decision or even Danny recognizing that and taking the initiative, all the better. I think it just seems like the right time to do it. And I think, Mm -hmm. you know, Danny was ready to go. I think the team was ready to move on. Um, so I don't think, I think it just happened where, you know, it made sense from everybody's perspective. Um, yeah. Cause it, you know, if Danny had any resent, I think it would have come through at some point. Um, right. But Probably. you know, I mean, he's also, you know, he's good with the, with the media and everything. So who knows, but yeah, definitely. Um, I think it's good for him. Well, we'll see how quickly he, he takes another job. You know, if uh, by the start of next season, he's the GM for Utah or some other team right. like we've oh, been yeah, hearing, I then I might feel a little differently about it. But yeah. uh, I mean, at least if you're going to take his word at face value, it seemed pretty like he was wanted to spend more time with his family. He alluded mm-hmm. to playing more golf at multiple times in a very right. short press conference. So yeah. I'm going to give him I the think, benefit of the doubt. I think he's ready to slow it down a little bit. And uh, yeah, you know, he set up Austin to, you know, as a front in the front office. So he's primed to, you know, probably be able to run his own show someday. Um, And, you know, he loves the Celtics. This is his team. Mm -hmm. I'm sure he's going to hang around and still want to, you know, stay in touch with players and work with players and whatnot. These are the things he, you know, seemingly loves to do Mm -hmm. much, much less, much lower stress. So, you know, for his health purposes, I mean, yeah. I don't know. If, I don't know if he's still having any health problems, but um, it's safe <laughs> to assume. You sound like there's... you're pretty close with uh, Dave. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, no. You got the medical records? Is, are we violating HIPAA here? Or what? Uh, it's all it's all <laughs> off record, so I can't really. Oh, talk, oh okay. But, um, he uh, so it's. I think it's good for. I think it's good for him. It's good for everybody. So I'm I'm excited yeah. for the fresh look. Um, and I guess we can. You know, if you want to start talking about Brad now, we can. We can get yeah. to that. Well, yeah, that's obviously the next step. First, I just want to talk, take a moment to appreciate the Danny Ainge tenure because I really, you never see enough of that, frankly. People basically want to run him out of town. And again, this is one of those things where go look at how other franchises do and how many GMs have this long a run of success with one organization. Um, And think about where the Celtics were at when Danny Ainge took over. It was ugly for a while we had fallen from the the peak of the nba in the 80s to basically the bottom of the 90s he came in and turned things around he really did um he made an unpopular decision he got rid of antoine walker which that team wasn't going anywhere he rebuilt us he got banner 17 with awesome trades obviously and then uh you know when things started to go south he did made another amazing trade and has now left us with two young <laughs> budding superstars who haven't even come into their prime yet are locked up long-term under contract. And we have every one of our own draft picks going forward as well as some other things. So again, it's easy, especially around here in this culture of like negative Boston media to kind of just point out the bad, but I'd like to appreciate all the good things he did and that at the position that he's left us in, there aren't many GMs in the league who can do that. So anyone who is going to look at his tenure and say, Oh, he only got one ring. Like that is just so stupid. Um, <laughs> the whole like rings culture of judging NBA that that's the only thing you can judge it by is like, no, he kept, uh, he, he 
turned a franchise around and kept us competitive and more for a long string of time. There are little things on the margins that affect the championship every year, but he did enough to have us fighting was, you know, one of the better GMs in the league for, for a long time. And that's, that's not nothing. That's a lot. Um, you know, and, and unfortunately he's probably not going to get his flowers till a lot later in life, but I think eventually people will look back and kind of realize uh, everything he meant to this organization. Yeah. I don't, I don't like the narrative where it's like, he's been here for 20 years and he's won one ship. Um, you know, there's been successful years mixed in there. Obviously the big three had a you know few good years, probably should have won another one, but um, you know, it didn't happen. And the thing is, it's like, since uh, I'm not hundred percent on this, but I think since 99, there's been like nine different champions. Mm-hmm. So like, Basically, you know, out of 32 teams, there's nine teams that have won it in the last 20 years. Right. So I think there's only five GMs that have made it to the finals multiple right. times, and he's yeah. one of them. So and it's, yet, like you said, only a handful that even have any rings. So, yeah. so I mean, again, if, it is, if it is and, nine, that could be wrong. And but. all of those guys who have more than one either had like LeBron right. or the Warriors. They're like, you know, one of these players that you just you can't get. So, uh, mm-hmm. I don't know. So it's, it's really hard to win in the NBA without mm-hmm. someone like LeBron Kawhi or, you know, or, Kawhi yeah. or right. someone of that, you know, Kobe, Shaq, um, you need, you need somebody like that to win a championship. And he built that with the original big three. Yeah. Um, out of basically nothing. Um, I mean, he kept Pierce around somehow who, uh, I mean, in today's NBA, Pierce probably would have been gone, you know, a few years, a few years before that. Um, So I think building what he did from the, um, you know, Patino Mm -hmm. era, I guess, to the championship, (laughs) it was basically starting from nothing to a championship and, you know, six or seven yeah. years, whatever it was. Absolutely. So th- that's hard to do, especially when you're not, a, you're not a city where you get, you know, free agents want to come here early, you know, superstars right. want to come here. Right. Um, it's hard to do. So, you know, it's almost, it's a big market with almost like small market appeal to big, you know, all-stars, superstars. Um, mm-hmm. So I think he did well there. And then, you know, completely breaking it down from, uh, the big three era to now, right. You know, the way he played it was he wanted to be competitive and build a young team. And he did that. It just didn't result in a championship yet. No. Um, and the, and I, what do you, his I mean, the, goal, same, the Kyrie thing is it's sucked. It was unfortunate. Yeah. Same with the Hayward thing, but like to go back and not play the captain hindsight game, like, mm those were objectively solid at worst moves. Like the Kyrie trade that he made was still a great trade. And if you just look on paper, like in terms of his job as a GM, he doesn't know that this guy is going to go off the reservation and sabotage the team and the potential roster build for the next few years. Like that's basically what happened, but it's revisionist history to act like Danny, you know, should have seen that coming or something. Yeah. Most I'd say most moves he made since Irving left or before Irving left were probably the right move. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, obviously Irving left and he, you know, I don't know if it was a snap decision to sign Kemba, but that yeah. wasn't, a, wasn't the right move, you know, looking back at it now. But, you know, trading for Kavi was the right move. It just didn't work out. I think signing mm-hmm. Hayward was the right move. He just broke his leg. <laughs> uh, right. Signing Al was the right move. He was perfect for, you know, what yeah. we were building at that point. It's just... His vision was to have a young nucleus and a veteran nucleus Mm. and to start, you know, create a dynasty basically. Yeah. And the Kyrie Hayward uh, Horford, you know, trio, I don't know if it would have been enough to win a championship, but that was the veteran core apparently that he had in mind. Um, I mean, obviously I think he preferred preferred Durant, but Six um, minutes into a season, and then it was yeah. all gone. <laughs> yeah. So then, you know, you have that that crew, 
and then you have the uh, Tatum, Jalen, Marcus coming up right behind them. So, you know, mm-hmm. ideally I don't, you transition from one to the other, but right. it just didn't work out. You know, you, two years yeah. later, you don't have any of those three guys and you're back to square one with the young team and right. young teams don't win. Right. So, and I mean, again, he's hopefully you mentioned that you need those guys, the Curry's, the LeBron's, the Kawhi's. Hopefully we have one of those guys now in Tatum and that's, Almost entirely thanks to Danny Ainge, the masterful trade he made. And then with the Nets, obviously, to get the picks. And then the even more masterful trade, maybe, to trade basically Fultz for Tatum. So, you know, if, again, this is stories far from unwritten. If 20 years from now, Tatum and Brown are putting their jerseys in the rafters and they've won us three championships or something, it'll be hard to not give a, a hell of a lot of that credit to Danny Ainge. So, like I said, he's a... Uh, far from leaving the cupboard bare he's if anything this is now probably one of the most desirable situations for any coach or gm in the league to take over he's kind of done the hard part in landing like the foundational pieces and he kind of just struck out the last few years on doing the at least proverbial easy part and kind of filling in the margins and getting the depth and the bench and everything else was obviously disastrous but he hit home runs on jason tatum and jalen brown and like I said, those guys are locked up long-term and they're not even in their primes yet. So that is uh we owe a lot that to Danny H similar. It's sort of a similar, you know, situation that happened in Philly, I guess, where, you know, they had, they have the young players where everyone, you know, crowned them as, you know, obviously the process mm-hmm. and, you know, B and Simmons are supposed to be the young nucleus that takes them to the, to the promised land. And then, you know, they struggled for a couple of years. Everyone was wondering if they were going to blow it up. And then, you know, they get a new coach, a new GM, and then they look like a championship contender this year. Um, So I feel like that's kind of what it is. Danny and Brad got us to this point where we have the pieces in place. It just wasn't the right mixture to get us to the next level. So now, you know, hopefully a new coach and a new GM um, well, Brad being the new GM will be able to get us over the hump and Mm -hmm. maybe, you know, next year we'll look like the, you know, we'll be Philly again and be like, all right, well, Celtics, I guess weren't as far away. Maybe they were more of the, you know, 2019 Celtics that we thought not as much of the 2020. So and I think that's the thing, like you said, Philly is a good example because think of how many people probably, especially Philly fans last year were yelling, you got to blow this up. And it was all, Simmons and a B can't play together and blah, blah, blah. And sure enough, give them a normal year, get healthy, make basically they traded Horford, which was a dumb contract signing on their part and filled that in with a, like good role players and a bench. And they had a great, they had the best season, you know, in the East, they're the one seed and they've got their own issues now with Embiid being out and whatnot, but it's a good lesson probably for the Celtics fans that like the road to the championship with a young team is not, just super smooth there are going to be bumps in the road every time something goes wrong you don't have to panic and say oh we got to trade one of the jays or whatever it is you know it's uh patience patience is a virtue in this league for sure Uh, young teams don't win in the nba it's just you know young teams and young superstars no matter how good you are don't win i mean right you know even lebron you know he couldn't win in cleveland and it took him till I don't know how old he was, 26, 27. Is that yeah. how old he was when he won his first one? Uh, uh, yeah, well, it was his eighth year in the league. So if he came either yeah. way, that's uh, this so, was Tatum's fourth. So, so perspective the, is important. Possibly the best player ever took him right. until his mid to late. I'm uh, sorry, it was his ninth season because they lost his first season in Miami. Right. But. Um, and then, you know, look at everyone else. I mean, Kobe is the only example, but he had Shaq, so. Right, he it's wasn't even just, MVP on those teams. Right, so it's so. it's you can't really I can't think of a good example where you know there is a one sub twenty five year old was the best player on a championship. There isn't Michael Jordan, so, the greatest player of all time. Look how long it took him to yeah. to get. You know, like people just want to forget the battle and focus on once it became great. I mean, even look at Stephen Clay. How many years before they were close to the Warriors? It didn't. They didn't just get drafted and start dominating the league. It's just not how it works. If anything, yeah. again, if anything, the Celtics are ahead of schedule, and that might have been one of their biggest downfalls was building setting the expectations probably too high mm-hmm. yeah the, the the fact that we had you know Hayward and Kyrie and Horford you know even if it wasn't the right 
mixture. Uh, they were really good all-star yeah. caliber veterans who knew how to win. For sure. So, you know, that makes a big difference. Even if they're, you know, I mean, they, you know, in theory probably were the best players on the team, you know, maybe not towards the end of Tatum when Tatum stepped up, but um, mm-hmm. you just need good veterans. I mean, it's, that's, that's you need that to win. Um, and we were getting to the uh, Eastern Conference finals, you know, sort of with and without them. Um, mm-hmm. But, you know, having that core of winning vets is crucial. You, it just, you don't win without it. And um, yeah. we obviously don't have that at all this year. So, and it, it showed. So, you know, yeah. the years, the years that we had, you know, good veteran play, we went deep in the playoffs. In the years we didn't, we got knocked on the first round. So, sure. Uh, I think it's pretty easy to see, you know, what the problem was. And if we didn't have that core of, you know, all star veterans, we wouldn't, we probably wouldn't have gone as deep as we did, you know, consistently, anyways. So, I mean, even just Al being on the team, I think, was a big, made a big Huge. difference for, for our player. Oh, yeah. Of course. Um, so, it just goes straight. Even like one guy like Al can make that bigger difference. I know, you know, there's a, you can debate on how how good you think Al is. I know it's a mm-hmm. it's a big one, but um, you know, I think that just shows that you need experience. And um, mm-hmm. if we didn't have that the last few years, and we were still like fighting our way at an upward trajectory, then this year wouldn't have been as disappointing to you know the general fan, uh, the common fan. So yeah. Um, Almost, you know, it's almost our success, you know, kind of bit us in the ass um, right. this year as far as perspective. It did. And, I mean, I get it. You get excited. You you see us get close. You want to get over the hump. But it just doesn't always work so uh, so perfectly. And obviously it didn't. But I'm, I'm glad we're both on the same page and showing Danny some love for, for everything he has done, uh, you know, for his whole tenure with the Celts. But now let's move on to the, at least to me, far more interesting part of this whole discussion, and that is Brad Stevens, who has now been promoted to the president of basketball operations. We'll see if he's actually the GM, if they name a GM. Like, I still think that title could go to Zarin with Brad being the Pobo and kind of working together. We'll see. It sounds like everyone's on board. It's going to be, a, you know, a group effort, which is good, and there's obviously a good group in place. But... um. I just got a lot of questions about this one. Like I said, this one really came out of nowhere. Um, So first of all, to the people saying like, what the hell? I think that's a fair question. I don't think anyone would have seen this coming. Um, It sounds like Brad said it's something that since the bubble, he's felt a little worn down on coaching. Um, So I don't know if part of this was just reflecting on the state of the NBA and realizing he liked kind of the other aspects and wanted to give this a try how much was uh, by design by the Celtics wanting like, I guess it boils down to, do you genuinely think this is what the Celtics wanted and thought like, this is the guy they love what they saw in Brad, his basketball mind, his acumen for this kind of thing, his ability to build a team kind of going back to the recruiting he did in college, et cetera. And they were like determined to do this. Or do you think they're kind of like, well, eh, we don't know what to do. We're already got this guy under this long contract we don't want to pay someone else and like fire them. Like, so they just kind of fell into it. So I guess how much of this kind of similarly to what I asked about Danny, how much of this is a genuine, the the desired outcome for the Celtics and for Brad? I really have no idea because I never, (laughs) I never saw, I never even thought that Brad being in the front office was an option now Mm -hmm. or in the future. He just, he's always just been a coach. And I mean, he's, it seems like what he's loved. That's his passion. I mean, I right. know coaches sometimes go to front office roles, but he just a lot of never, them. He just never struck me as you know a front office guy. And I, I don't know if he, I don't know if that means he can do it or not. It's just, I just never would have thought this was coming anytime soon, anyways. And I didn't think, I didn't think Brad or Danny were going to get fired this year. Um, mm-hmm. So that that's not a surprise. But Brad getting this I guess promotion is just I don't know Uh, it's I just didn't I don't know how anyone could know if it's the right move or not because for sure obviously I don't know how anyone 
could judge his ability to be a front office executive. I just, mm -hmm. I mean, obviously, like you said, he, he was a recruit, he recruited in, you know, college basketball, but that's yeah. very different. Than it is very different, obviously. But I mean, I think in the NBA. it's a good, it's good. It's obviously good that he went at a small school like Butler and was able to find the players and build a team that was able to make it to the national championship is really impressive. Whole different animal, obviously, than what he's doing in the NBA, but it at least shows the ability to build a roster. Like we said, he's been obviously discussing this with Danny and others since at least for a few months. So it's something he's considered. I don't think he's just going into this decision willy nilly. I think there's a good chance that he's kind of just like, he's been doing this for eight years. He looks around and he's like, there's only so much I can do as a coach, but I can get into the front office and I can fix this. I can build the team I want. Um, I mean, he's been frustrated at times, clearly with the players he's been given. He didn't like the two center thing. I don't think he didn't, he was doing a lot of stuff. I think just cause those were, that was what he's been given. So I think that's the way to look at it is, Hey, if anyone was up close and personal and saw what was wrong with the Celtics and what they need, it's Brad. So if the idea is that he's now going to go in there and fix it and make things right, that at least makes sense to me um, in a vacuum. Like, again, is he going to be able to get it done? Does he know how to trade? Does he know how to negotiate contracts, stuff like that? I, I don't know. We'll see. And like you said, it's, it's hard to judge, but I mean, all of these guys have to start somewhere. A lot of them go from coaching to being GMs and, that you know he has his finger on the pulse of the nba i think everyone agrees he's like a brilliant basketball mind he knows the game he knows the league he knows the players he knows the celtics um and so i think that's another positive obviously he has a good relationship with the players they all always say nothing but good things about brad um so i mean a lot of what they said if you want to buy into it like maybe they feel that he can help the team more in this role and use his mind to to clean up some of danny's mistakes i guess so to speak or to do to do make it work in a way that Danny couldn't. And, uh, you know, I think this is great for the Jays as now Brad is who's their guy is in the front office. So I think this is Tatum's team. This is just another signal of that, that he'll be heavily involved in all the decisions going forward. I don't, not that I don't think they weren't close with Ainge, but certainly it's on another level with Brad. Um, so I think, you know, these are all the positives there that you look at and he knows what he's doing in that sense. As for doing the actual job, again, no one really knows, but he's, he's got a good foundation around him, good pieces in place. And from like a basketball standpoint, you obviously trust him. I, I think everyone agrees he knows what he's doing. It's just he's not setting up out of bounds plays. He's uh, <laughs> kind of putting the pieces together. But I don't think he'd be taking the job if he wasn't confident. Um, if you heard kind of the presser today, it sounds like he's all the way in. Again, he's all the way in on the Celtics, bringing them a title. I think Wick said that, Brad will bring them banner 18 or die trying. So <laughs> I like hearing quotes like that. Um, so again, if they're really all in on this and not just kind of, they were just backed into this position, then I feel, I guess, better about it. Again, I'm open to the change in general. Um, so yeah, I'm willing to give Brad a shot. I just hope that, like I said, this wasn't a situation where they're like, eh, well, we're already paying you. So let's try this. And he'll be coaching Duke in a year. I don't know. Um, so that's one way to look at it. Then also it makes you think back to when those kind of Indiana coaching rumors were swirling. Do you think that there was already anything in place by then? Do you think they had mentioned it to Brad of like, Hey, don't leave us for Indiana. You're going to be our president of operations, et cetera, anything like that. So again, it's like, how much do you think this is like, we're all in on this versus how much was just like, well, how are we going to save face? I don't know. Let's try this. And if Brad sucks, we'll fix it in a year. Mm, I don't think the Celtics are the type of team that would just be like, you know, well, you know, we don't want to eat the rest of your contract. And I don't think, you know, necessarily they would be, you know, strong armed mm -hmm. into him leveraging the Indiana job. Um, so I don't want to say it's not, you know, it's not possible that that factored into it, but um this kind of seems like something that, you know, you would only do if your, you know, if ownership was comfortable with it. Um, right. Something that they really thought about. Um, it's just, it's too big of a, you know, franchise altering decision for them to just, you know, go out on a whim. Um, mm -hmm. So I want to say, I want to think that they did it, you know, they thought it through and they actually thought this was the best move for the team. So, yeah, I'm not, and I'm not worried about Brad, you know, and all the 
logistics of being the uh, president of basketball operations and making trades and all that stuff. I think he gets the league. I think he gets, you know, um, you know, all the nuances of Mm -hmm. being the president of basketball operations. Um, So I think that'll be fine. It's just, you know, it's just, we just, you have to wonder now is if he's been more involved all along in these, you know, roster moves and making trades the last, you know, in his tenure. Um, now you got to think like, you know, was he more involved and, uh, yeah. and that's sort of, it's already been like a work in progress towards us. So um, maybe recently, I don't, I don't, it doesn't sound like it's something that's been brewing beyond this season. Yeah. I mean, I'm not saying it's been brewing beyond the season, but mm-hmm. you know, it's possible that he's been involved, you know, more in the whole, you know, yeah. roster construction and uh, trades all along than we thought mm-hmm. he was. Uh, I'm sure he always had input in it, but, right. um, you know, I don't know, maybe, maybe this has been something that he's been, you know, working with Danny, you know, with that whole end of it. Um, I would hope at least a little. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, cause you can't, you can't just say there's no way he was just been strictly a coach and, yeah. you know, had very little to do with the roster construction other than right. you know, Danny saying, what do you think of this? Yeah. Um, so, you know, I, I got to think that he's been somewhat groomed into this position. Definitely. And, and I think I hope it transitions. I mean, he, he knows basketball in and out. Um, well, right. And that, I think that's at the end of the day, the most important thing is that if you just look at his profile as who he is before he was a coach, like even the way we viewed him as a coach was kind of like he was one of those smart, nerdy, quiet, like basketball savants. And usually those are the kind of up and coming guys who will get into those front offices and make a big difference versus a coach. I mean, he was a really good coach, but um, you know, maybe this is actually the, the best destination for him. Who knows? It's, it's too, obviously way too early to say, but uh, I think there's at least reason for optimism with the move. I think he, I think it's possible that he sort of sees the writing on the wall with, you know, just coaching in the NBA in general, where, Right. You know, he could be the best coach in the league. I mean, yeah, you know, arguably, but you know, the right. best coaches aren't necessarily matter. winning championships. It's yeah, the best you know, coaches with the best players who are able to manage, you know, player egos and um, you know, just manage the uh, you know, the the talent. Mm-hmm. I think that's really what it comes down to. I mean. You know, you can be, we've seen, you know, we've seen these former player coaches that, you know, do little to nothing or, you know, like Ty Lu, basically just a figurehead in there and, uh, you know, winning championships with LeBron. So um, I think, I think being a good coach is important, but I think he's looking and he's like, this is more of like, you know, not, yeah. I don't want to say like a babysitter role, but it's, there's only so much he can do with his personality. Um, right to bring the team to the next level i think you know, yeah he sees that we need somebody you know people players superstars are responding to a different kind of coach right now so um, yeah i think he, he can still put his you know basketball mind to good use in the front office which is probably That's- why they, they decided to make this move so um, right i think you know now he knows too this roster better than anyone so he probably knows what you know, sort of coach would be a good fit for that. Uh, yeah. And I think that's another key part is the the next coach. Like he's, like I said, he's been there for eight years and there's, again, I think anyone who just has the Brad Stevens era as a coach was not successful. Again, is just moving the goalposts and having ridiculous expectations. The guy came straight out of college with no NBA experience and almost immediately turned the team that was supposed to be rebuilding into a contender from scratch. Um, so he said overwhelming success in his eight years with the Celtics. Um, obviously disappointing the way it ended, but hopefully this is the start of something much bigger and better. Uh, at first, so when I first saw the Woj tweet or the Shams, Shams, I forget who had it first, but either way, the first tweet was that Brad would be taking the this role. I kind of thought that meant he was going to be like the Belichick almost of the Celtics, be the coach and the president of basketball operations, which I would be very out on. Um, I just don't think that's a good idea for pretty much anyone. So when I saw that, I was like, oh, no, this is bad. Now that I see this, I'm hopeful that maybe part of it was even the self-realization on Brad's part of like, 
it is time for a new voice. I've done all I can with these guys. I've done a lot. I've helped them grow into where they are, but it's time for a new type of voice to go in. And maybe there was even some frustration on his part where he's like, I can't reach these guys. And so, yeah, like you said, hopefully he does have a good idea in mind already of like, this is the kind of guy they need. And I'm sure there are targets in his head that they're going to go out um, and get. So, yeah, I mean, I think I don't want to be overly optimistic, but is there a chance that this works out when we end up with a better kind of front office and a better coach maybe um you know it's taken me a while to kind of get there based on when i first heard the news but it's a possibility um you know we'll see we'll see obviously what happens next but uh again i think at first this seemed like the end of a celtics disaster season they're blowing things up oh god now it's kind of like this makes some sense. Uh, I can see the path to this quickly looking like actually a better situation and really good decisions all around for the organization. Yeah, I'm, I'm optimistic and I, I agree the whole changing of the voice um, in the locker room. I think, I think it was probably time. I mean, this, this makes sense um, to, you know, it makes sense. I think to, you know, change the voice and as far as the, you know the coach but we just we never he was never going to get fired so the only way to change the change the voice and you know keep brad around was you know this sort of promotion and i think it was probably i think everybody kind of almost swallowed their pride a little bit and realized that you know they weren't the right fit in their current role anymore from you know danny to brad brad was probably like i'm not the guy to coach this team but I can yeah. still get them to where they need to be in a different role. And Danny was probably like, you know, I've done everything I can here. I'm, you know, I'm kind of losing my, my fire, my motivation, whatever. I'm not the right guy here anymore. And he stepped down. So I think, I think it just all kind of fell into place. Um, yeah. Hopefully. I mean, I hope it's right. nothing more I mean, than again, that, but that's kind of what, that's how they're playing it off. So I want to take sure. them back, take them for the world. Yeah. yeah. And you know, they say no, no breakups are mutual, but it does at least for now, seem like they all maybe at first there was a little bit of pressuring here and there and someone wanted it more than others, but it seems like at least now they are all on the same page. At least that's, that's the way they're presenting it. Um, I hope that is the case. If not, you know, we'll probably find out, but for now it looks good. Um, who do you think uh, was happier about this news? Uh, Grant Williams agent or Shemi's agent? Um, <laughs> they'll know. be both getting maxes from Brad, right? Yeah, I mean they're gonna get paid now for sure. <laughs> uh, I don't know, probably Grant. <laughs> yep, yep. Well, okay. Shemmy's Shemmy's up this year, right? <laughs> yeah, he is. He'll probably be. Well, uh, who knows? Who knows? He's, he's gonna be coveted, but it'll so. be interesting to find out, I guess, now how much. Um, you know how much Brad and Danny were on the same page, or if. Brad's going to come in and we're going to see half these guys gone in, in like the first two weeks of the off season. So just for that alone, it'll be really interesting. Um, or if Brad kind of, you know, stays the course and mostly keeps it together. I don't know. That'll be interesting, but uh, we'll, we will certainly get to find out one way or another. Um, yeah, it'd be interesting to see if Brad has, you know, if he has a balls in the front office, if he can be right. cutthroat. Cause I mean, yeah, he's been with these guys, you know, a lot of these guys for years, um, even though yes. they're still young. So, I mean, is he going to be able to like, you know, go to Shemi or go to Grant or whatever, or go to Shemi and be like, Hey, you know, thanks for your service, but you know, right. You either sign yeah. for the minimum I mean, or go find he's, your, he's going to have to do that. Yeah. He's going to have to, or he's not going to last long. And um, yeah. yeah, I mean, I think hopefully that is the idea for all we know, he's been sitting there super frustrated thinking in the back of his head, like what the hell I, I know what we're missing. I could fix this. And now hopefully, yeah, he'll get the chance and he will be aggressive and use his voice and say, listen, this is what we need to do. I don't care if people aren't going to like it. It's happening. Um, mm -hmm. You know, that's obviously what you, what you need. So I hope he, he trusts himself and the guys in that office to make the decisions going forward. And we'll see, I guess, but um, yeah, certainly a lot to process, I guess, just to ask you, if you went from now versus, I don't know, 24 hours ago, or maybe right at the, the end of the game, whatever you want to go back in time, basically before this news, in terms of the Celtics future, do you feel better, worse, or about the same overall direction? Of the I, team? I feel better just because we know now that 
they looked at this season and said, this is, you know, unacceptable and things mm-hmm. need to change. And they changed in a big way. So yeah. I'm happy to see that they just, you know, I mean, I guess this would be more of an ownership um, decision. Um, I'm glad that they looked at this one like, you know, we need to do something drastic here. And rather mm-hmm. than, you know, blow up the team, they went from the front Well, that could route. still happen. <laughs> I mean, yeah, it could still happen. But I think, I think these moves kind of yeah. show that it's going to be, I mean, it's there a, could be a lot of roster changes, but, you know, right. I don't, nobody's, they're not trading, you know, Jalen or, or Jason or anything crazy like that. It's just, mm-hmm. um, you know, they're going to, they're, I think at, during the year and even 24 hours ago, if you told me, you know, Danny stepped down and we had a new GM and we we're going to have a new coach, I'd be like, all right, well, I'm interested <laughs> to see how that, like, I, I think that's a yeah. step in the right direction. And yeah. I don't hate Danny. I don't hate Brad. I just think probably, I think having a new GM and a new coach is probably the best thing for this team. Um, yeah. And, you know, who stepped into that GM role is, is a, obviously a huge surprise and um but yeah i mean just the fact that we have a new gm and a new head coach going into right 2021 22 i think i'm feeling better about the team yeah that's all fair definitely and i mean obviously that's it's i'm asking you kind of an unfair question because it's hard to assess without knowing who that head coach will be and who it is i think uh you know will play a big role at least in how i feel about the team at least next year and beyond so again i think we're all confident that everyone within the Celtics, probably from the players to an extent to Brad and the other guys around the team, hopefully have a good idea of what, at least what kind of a coach they want. Um, the first two names rumored were Jason Kidd and Lloyd Pierce by Chris Haynes. I think hopefully those are just uh, putting those names out there to do a favor to them to make people think that they might actually get hired for a head coaching job or something. I uh, don't think either of those will be the next head coach. I certainly hope not. Um in terms of what we're looking for, I think I'll give you a chance in a second, but I think we're mostly on the same page in that we're probably looking for a former player who holds some clout, um, maybe can relate to these guys more on a personal level, um, someone they respect, and will be able to kind of call guys out um, and whatever with them, you know, fully having their attention and respect. Again, not that Brad didn't. I don't want to make it sound like Brad like lost the locker room or whatever, but it's just a fact he didn't play in the league. Um, and he's not like a super commanding presence. So yeah, it might be good to have a new guy in there, a guy who's been in the league, a guy who's had success in the league, a guy who's, who's been through it and knows from the player's side. And, you know, again, that, I, that all clearly holds a lot of weight, um, in the NBA. So just kind of a voice like that, uh, the obvious names out there in no particular order, but we got guys thrown around like Chauncey Billups, Sam Cassell. Uh, Kenny Atkinson, Jawan Howard, long shot, uh, Jerry Stackhouse. Those are kind of the guys who fit the mold that I was just talking about. Um, I mean, I guess you could argue like Mark Jackson fits that mold, but he, I'm, I'm not too in love with that idea. And then you've heard kind of the maybe long shot college guys like a Jay Wright has been floated. Um, Jay Laranega obviously is the assistant now has the familiarity and deserves at least a look. Um, and then there's word that if the Celtics wait, this is a position that a lot of guys would be interested in. So we see how the playoffs shake out. Maybe that means, you know, Mike D'Antoni when the Nets playoff run is over. Um, I had mentioned to you, maybe Rick Carlisle, if the Mavs lose in the first round again, um, Becky Hammond could be the first female coach ever has had a shitload of success uh, in her career obviously so uh i guess what i'm trying to say is we don't really know there are a lot of names being thrown around um those are kind of the obvious names that seem like they'd be next in line for jobs that open up or it could be some some kind of dark horse uh but what do you think i guess in terms of the kind of coach you're looking for and then maybe the names i just mentioned or anyone else who's on your radar yeah we're on the same page as far as what we're looking for um I do think ideally it would either be, you know, some sort of well-respected former player, you know, ideally someone that, you know, the young players, you know, watched growing up um, someone, you know, like a Chauncey Billups, Sam Cassell type mm-hmm. thing. I mean, I know that that was, you know, people like Tatum and Brown were 
little kids when they were in their prime, but um, you know, but they know who still, they are. They, they know, know who they are, they are. and they're, much. they have a good presence. Um, you know, they just, you know, especially Chauncey, they feel like he's a no nonsense kind of guy, which I think we right. kind of need. Um, so I'm not saying he's going to be a great coach, but someone like that, he I should. think I don't want, I mean, those guys have been on the bench. They, they fit the role of what we're yeah. looking for. At least if they, yeah. who knows yeah. when it comes to X's and O's, but but we'll again, see. that's why you I, don't, you know, you fill out good assistance and you can make up for that kind of thing. Yeah, I guess. You keep Jay Laranaga on the bench yeah. and challenge you as a head coach. And I think you're all set with X's and O's yeah. and them. Um, but I felt also, like Brad can't still help. <laughs> Brad right. can help mold the next oh, yeah, coach exactly. too in a lot of ways. Yeah. So, um, you know, I don't, I don't want Jason kid. I mean, I know he Ugh. in theory fits that mold, but no, he's I had just, his chances. He, he's, yeah, he's had a chance. I don't want Jason kid. He's a shitty yeah. person. He's a domestic yeah. abuser. All right. He is a f- enemy of Boston in his playing days, also mm-hmm. on the court. Um, and he's just sucked as a coach anyway. So he's not also out. with that. Um, yeah, I don't think so. So like either a person like Chauncey or Cassell, something like that, or someone like D'Antoni. Like I would yeah, I would like I would definitely put a lot of consideration to D'Antoni. And I know he's never won anything, but he's been a part of yeah you know, some really good teams in the past. He's, yeah. you know. He just makes obvious sense because of the way he coaches offense and yeah. how and frustrating the Celtics offense would be. Like, you'd think he could take this group. I mean, we'll, again, we don't know what the final roster will look like for next season, but just any group around Jason and Jalen, you'd think he could take them to the next level as offensive players. So that yeah. one. An experienced, an experienced respected coach. He's been yeah. around for a while. He's coached, you know. You say he hasn't stars. won anything, but he's he's come damn close. I mean, oh, yeah. he's, no, he's, he's had plenty he's of success of as an NBA had, coach. He just hasn't won a lot of games and had again, playoff runs. Is not a fair way, in my estimation, to judge success. No. And this, but, league, I mean, I think but, a lot of people. That's how a lot of people are going to react to it. Like, oh, right, which is Antonio, but dumb. he's never he's never won a championship. It's like, all right, well, a lot of coaches, a lot of good right. coaches, a lot of good coaches. Yeah, definitely agree. Really, you know, great coaches don't win until they win. So. Mm-hmm. Maybe he, you know, this might be the right fit. I don't, but I don't want to get too far ahead of myself. But someone like right. D'Antoni, I would definitely be interested in. Yeah. Um, I don't know. And I, I mean, think you get you get a, a the kind of guy. If that's the case, if you're going to go with like a D'Antoni or Carlisle, a more proven NBA coach, you'd want probably a guy like we're discussing as an assistant at least. Yeah. No, definitely. Want at least a former player on the bench. I know they have Evan Turner, and also I don't know if you saw Evan Turner tweeted out. I think at least kind of joking he tweeted out that uh, the rumors aren't true. I will not be the next head coach of the Celtics. He did say that to which Jason Tatum responded. And again, I think joking, at least partly uh, I wish those rumors were true. Uh-huh. Basically so saying he wanted to turn to be the coach again. I think they're more kind of like we're joking around his buddies, whatever. I certainly hope and assume that Tatum has a very um, loud voice in, in any decisions that are being made about the yeah. next several years of the franchise and i assume this was more of a lighthearted twitter exchange than anything else and i'm not really suggesting evan turner is ready to be an nba head coach but hopefully uh he'll stay on the staff i like him and it seems like the guys do too yeah evan i think he but they, will be, i think they I, need a more powerful voice to like what you were right. talking about a guy who's a little older and had maybe a little a little more success in the league and has, has kind of been through it a little bit like a chauncey or a, a cassell certainly guys who won championships as players well, he does have a very deep, powerful voice. So I think you mean figuratively, <laughs> sure. right? I did. Um, so yeah, I think he, I think he could be a good, a good player, uh, a good coach someday. But I don't think he's he's not the guy we need right now. Um, yeah. So I mean, I think we're on the same page as what works here: proven, respected head coach, or um, you know, former player, respected mm-hmm. player. So I don't, yeah. like, I don't, I don't want to see. I know everybody. I know the players love Jay Laranaga and you know, I love the guy mm-hmm. too, but that's right. not really, I feel like that's just right. It wouldn't be the, the new Brad, voice that we're Yeah. I feel like it's Brad light. It's the same yeah. thing, same voice. He's probably sure. You know, Brad 2.0 in a sense. I mean, he might bring a little something different, but that's, I don't think that's mm-hmm. the guy. Um, what about Jay Wright? The super successful college coach from Nova. Uh, I would see, I'm, I'm not sure that like, I get nervous about the college coach. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't know if that's fair or unfair. And he's obviously no, been around fair. for a while and he's, you know, well-respected and, you know, he's won. Um, mm-hmm. And he probably does have, you know, some clout with the, these young players. Cause you know, he right. was 
I'm sure he recruited most of them. Um, so I don't know. It's just, I don't, if we're going to, if we're going to take a, you know, someone who hasn't been an NBA coach before, I'd rather take a flyer on a former player. Um, first fair. Um, there's really not anyone in the NBA. I mean, in college basketball that I'd really want to take that shot. I don't think, um, maybe, I mean, I guess Juwan Howard's on that list, but yeah, Jerry Stackhouse. Think, yeah, I, mean, I, I don't think I don't think they fit Juwan the Howard mold though of what we're talking. Right. No, right. I don't think they are either. And I mean, for the record, I don't. I'd be surprised if Jay Wright even left. I mean, I'm sure right. they'll, I'm sure they'll call Mike Shashevsky, but I don't think yeah. he's taking the job. Right. Um, it could be someone like that though. They've talked about guys with Duke ties, Jeff Capel, who recruited like helped recruit Zion and Ingram to Duke, mm-hmm. something like that. Um, but yeah, I, I don't, I don't see it either. I think they need someone with more kind of name name recognition mm-hmm. uh who can you know have a, have like you said a loud voice uh figuratively and then becky hammond the wild card um not the wild card i, I don't think that's fair to say and i think people look too much into like oh she'd be the first woman's coach though this would be like a crazy like out on a limb experiment blah 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 that's just like nonsense she has proven herself as a great coach she's a disciple of one of the best coaches of all time, maybe the best of our era in Popovich. Um, she's coached for USA basketball. Um, so, you know, she's the players know her. Everyone respects her. Everyone says she's a great coach. If that's the direction they choose, I, again, I would imagine Jalen and Tatum and even Marcus and Kemba who played for her and know her well from the team USA. So they have good things to say about her. She'd come highly recommended from pop, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so, you know, I wouldn't, I'm sure a lot of people would hate that for all the wrong reasons, but I certainly think that could be a good hire, hire as well. I, you know, I love Becky. She's definitely a good coach and will be a head coach eventually. Um, I just, it has nothing to do with her being a woman. I just don't think that's, that's just not the type of coach I'm looking for. Um, I'd prefer, I mean, like, what, what do you mean about. by that? Um, the mold as far as, you know, she's, hasn't been an NBA head coach before. And I don't want to take, well, I don't, I don't, the, neither have the other guys you're talking about. No, but Andy I don't want to take and Sam Cazella have haven't been NBA head coaches. I'm talking about if we have someone that's not a head coach, I want it to be a former player. So I either want that <laughs> experienced right. D'Antoni type person who has been in the league, been a head coach for a long time, or that, you know, former player that can come in and, you know, immediately, um, you know, relate to these, relate to these younger kids or whatever. Um, Hammond, it's going to be great, but you know, it's the same reason why, you know, well, I mean, I guess I wouldn't mind, um, you know, Carlisle or anything, but um, that's just not, it's not really what I had in mind. I wouldn't be surprised she gets called, but I also feel like she's being groomed to take over for pop. I I don't think, I think that's, I think that's the plan is pop's gonna, you know, hang around for however much longer. And then she's going to take over. Mm. Um, Cause we know how much pop loves her yeah, for, for the right reason. So um, she's going to be great someday somewhere. Um, I'm just looking for something a little different. Yeah. Um, I, that's fair. I mean, again, I wouldn't be, there are just, there are hires that would disappoint me a lot more than that. I yeah, wouldn't no, say disappointment's was, the right word. She's yeah. Not, she's probably she's not, not my number one choice, but she's, no. I'd be, she'd be a, a fine choice. She's not far down the list for me, but yeah, I could probably easily talk not into it. top five. I mean, maybe, maybe five. I don't know. I mean, I'm, I'm sure there's people we're not even considering, but if we're just looking at like, you know, who has the best odds right now, um, you know, she's probably, you know, top five, I guess. She was in the top, top five, five, yeah. I yeah. think so, so, in terms of yeah, Vegas she, betting, so. Well, the, the odds I'm looking at right now have her as plus 800, number five behind Kid. There you go. Right ahead of Kenny Atkinson, so. Yeah. Um, So, she's up there, but as, as far as, like, you know, yeah. people I want, it's probably Cassell, right. Chauncey, um, you know, D'Antoni, and those type of yeah. things, Howard, something like that. And then she's right there right after them. So again, I, I wouldn't be bummed. It's just, she's not my number one. Totally. And I think that's, that's all fair. Um, I think they'll interview the guys in house and 
think in sports, usually in general, the more kind of continuity you can have in your staff and your front office, even in your players and all that, the better. I mean, obviously, as long as those people are good and successful, which for the most part we have been. So I think the more kind of the more of those voices in the front office we can keep of like the Zarin Ainge crew, the better, the more assistant coaches with the Evan Turner, Laranega, those guys, uh, Jerome Allen, the better. Um, so I, you know, I hope it's not a complete overhaul, but sometimes, especially with the coaching staff, you hire a new head coach, they are going to want to pick their own assistants. So we'll see what happens. Um, again, this is still all very raw. This news just coming in within the last uh, eight hours or so we're kind of, digesting it all and, and analyzing it for you on the fly. Um, we've done our best to shed some light, hopefully on the situation, a lot of speculation. We're not really reporting anything or giving you any other information than our own opinions uh, or what we've heard. And yeah, I, I think that that kind of covers it, at least for now, we're still kind of waiting more news could drop at any moment. I think the Celtics will probably wait on a coach at least a little bit, like I said, see what happens the rest of these playoffs, make sure they get the right guy, etc. This is all happening fast so far. So hopefully now we can pause and slow down a little bit, see what the next steps are. Um, one other thought, I guess, since I mentioned it at the beginning in terms of the potential spending restrictions that uh, ownership may have put in place. Any part of you think that maybe uh, this had been a discussion going on and it got to the point where Ainge knows that the team is just not going to let him spend anymore the way he wants. And he said, all right, well then I'm out. Uh, I don't think so. Um, I don't think the team team doesn't have a problem uh, spending if they're winning. Um, oh. They say Which, that. Well, yeah, I, just, I think that's the case. We'll, I mean, see, Wick, we'll see it. You know, we got to see it. But Wick's I, one yeah. of the more passionate owners and, you know, he's, mm-hmm. one, he's super involved and he just seems like a guy, you know, from what he says and the way he acts, he really, really wants to, you know, win. Um, and if that's, you know, I don't know, he's not, you know, the only person that makes the financial decisions, but I think he's at the top of the list. Um so to have someone, you know, have an owner like that, I think is, you know, I, I think it's, it's reasonable enough to think that he'll, he'll spend as long as they have like a plan in place. And like this, you know, yeah. he's talked into being like, this is, these are the moves we got to make in order to win a championship. But um, I don't know, maybe he's, you know, it's possible he wasn't convinced that Danny was the guy to do that. And um, that's how it unfolded. But I don't think, I don't think they were, he was basically cutting Danny's, you know, taking the checkbook away from Danny um, or anything like that. Yeah, no, I don't either. It's just, just something to consider and we'll see, you know, if they end up tr- making moves that seem like they're almost kind of going fully into the youth and not competing. Like if they don't bring back Fournier or they just completely dump Kemba or Marcus or whatever, then maybe you'll look back and say, oh, maybe this all was kind of just about transitioning while saving some money. And that's why they promoted Brad and got rid of Danny and they're just trying to get under the tax and whatever. I certainly hope that's not the case, but uh, we we just don't know. We really don't know until uh, more of the stuff plays out. Uh, Any, any other thoughts on any of this, I guess, before I wrap up? No, I, um, I mean, I think we've, we've listed out all the, everything we know. I think we've, you know, speculated, you know, reasonably um, everything we can possibly speculate within reason. Um, Mm -hmm. And now it's, you know, I'm, I'm excited. I mean, it gave me a little bit of, you know, it gave me a little bit of uh, a little bit of energy coming into, you know, reflecting on the Celtic season. It's nice that we don't have to, you know, we have something other than, you know, this Brooklyn series to talk about. So, yeah. I'm excited to see what happens. I think, you know, this could be good. It could be a disaster, but I think <laughs> it was the right time to make a move like this. Yeah. No, I'm with you. There you go. And like you said, it would have been kind of a dull, dark day uh, to lament on the season, the season from hell, which is now finally over. And now with this, it's like, we're really, we're turning over a new leaf. We're turning the page on that season. It's that's in the past. And now we're ready to move and look towards the future. Hopefully some opti- optimism, optimism, um, it was a tough season. It was disappointing. It seemed like nothing went our way, especially off the court with injuries, with COVID, with everything else. Uh, again, just like one disaster after another. And eventually they just added up to the point where it was too much. And that's, that took the season away. So it's, 
you know, in that sense, a lost season, but I think there were a lot of, a lot of stuff was gained, um, you know, especially in the growth of some of the young guys and this and that. So again, ready to, to turn, turn the page and move on. So we, obviously the playoffs still going on, not for the Celtics, um, but you know, then the draft at the end of July and then uh, free agency training camps, all that, like you said, our next coach could be hired at any time. So we've got a lot, a lot of changes coming, whether those will be, major foundational changes we'll see but uh well you at least know we'll have a new head coach so uh nick and i will be joining you again you know next week we'll see how much the dust has settled if we've named the coach if anything else has come to light but either way we'll be back to break down uh more in depth kind of the whole season maybe go through the players give everyone a, a grade kind of end of season report card as we did in the middle of the season and then we'll have a mega off-season preview um and again, like I said, the, the, the games might be over for now, but we certainly will have a hell of a lot of stuff to talk about. And uh, we will be back as always. So thanks for joining us. Chuddy heads for Nick. I'm Ben. We'll see you guys again soon. Keep your heads up. A new era is coming. Go south. Should have never sent them to pick up the work for me. Spray the park and had my shit inside the car. Marcus Smart Boy was shooting with a 36 on him. Said if he wasn't in a rush, they was all gone. His tech cursive on the jets, he was gone, Sean John. They were sleeping on the garden and dawn, dawn.